like the soccer player you discussed with chronic dings to the head, they're getting chronic damage. Calcified plaque is much, much less dangerous than soft plaque is. The perfect combination for helping to preserve thymic function is going to be using growth hormone secretagogues, optimizing my hormones, semaglutide, pisepatide, the newer generation, liraglutide, things like that are all what we call GLP-1 eggs. We've kind of like this. Welcome to our Q&A highlights. Q&A sessions are recorded every month and our enhanced members get an exclusive opportunity to ask questions from one of Cellular Medicine's brightest minds, Dr. Elizabeth Yurth. Get a chance to ask your questions by becoming our enhanced member at bli.academy slash memberships. You also get access to our content library full of tips, articles, videos, lectures, previous live Q&A sessions, and more. Using BTC and TB4, thymus and beta-4, in athletes for neural protection. Traumatic brain injury, chronic traumatic encephalitis are very underrepresented problem. And, you know, remember, TBI is a leading cause of morbidity worldwide, leading cause. So even those, like the soccer player you discussed with chronic dings to the head, they're getting chronic damage. There's a great study that was done on mice where they dropped a weight on the poor little mouse's head. And then they looked at what happened and the mice who were taking BPC had minimal brain trauma. The mice who were not on BPC had significant brain damage after the low weight was dropped on their head. So you can actually protect the damage from occurring by pre-treating with BPC. Thymus and beta-4 is not good taken orally. I don't think that you can get thymus and beta-4 orally at any benefit. But KPV, right, which is like that gut ties I talked about, BPC, KPV, BPC and KPV together taken orally because KPV also has some really significant benefits. So there's some very interesting studies on KPV in, in prevent, preventing neuroinflammation. So what you want to do is if I get hit, I don't want the inflammatory response to occur. So what I would do is, you know, if you've got somebody who's involved in sports or you're involved in sports yourself, or if you have a kid who's playing high school football or high school soccer, or if you just fall down and hit your head a lot, you should be taking just these on a regular basis, right? You take one cap a day on a regular basis. And then if you have an injury, take a lot, right? Take more, three times a day. For you guys who, who aren't familiar with the thymus gland, it is a huge gland when we're born. It's in our chest, bilobed, it, and it's the main thing that teaches our immune system. It teaches our immune system what's bad, what's good. It tells our immune system to attack a virus and not attack ourselves. So our, when we're babies, we're learning all of these things. And then the thymus gland gets bigger and bigger and bigger until puberty, and then it begins to shrink. And so what happens is as we get thymic involution, sometimes because of, you know, disease states or stress states or infections or chemotherapy or things like that, that will damage the thymus. And sometimes it's simply age. So as we age, the thymus and all of us get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's why our immune system, as we get older, we're more predisposed to dying of a virus than we might have been when we were young, like 13, when our thymus gland was huge. So if we can maintain thymic function, there's a lot of evidence that supports we actually will stop or at least markedly delay or reduce age-related decline in immune function. And age-related decline in immune function may be a lot of the link to age, disease, and death. So in my mind, the perfect combination for helping to preserve thymic function is going to be using growth hormone secretagogues, optimizing my hormones, and using a low-dose GLP-1 agonist. And I think that's going to be actually better on the proof, but it's going to be the mechanisms that, that they were looking at. This is, this, this is, I think, a better way to stimulate those mechanisms. And then, you know, we can always use thymic peptides or thymic bioregulators like thymogen, things like that, that might help as well. So thymic peptides like thymus alpha-1, thymus and beta-4, it's likely those giving back what the thymus gland isn't making anymore. So those are options too that you can use as well, as well as trying to, you know, maintain as much function as possible as you age, or if you were sick or damaged or have immune issues. Calcified plaque is much, much less dangerous than soft plaque is, right? It, it, how do we actually just get rid of it altogether? One of the things that I go to is colchicine. So colchicine is a drug that's been around a long time for treating gout. But there's some recent large-scale clinical trials using low-dose colchicine that shows a very significant anti-inflammatory therapy of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. It's safe. It's well-tolerated. It's a drug that's been around for a long time. So 
that's one of my go-tos when I have plaque is to go to low dose colchicine. You can also use vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 helps direct calcium away from the arteries and actually into the bone, preventing its accumulation in arterial walls. So any excess calcium, um, that like dietary intake of calcium, if you're taking K2 along with it, then we get less risk of plaque formation. All right. Mm, what else? Dietary intake of uh, arginine, taurine, glycine. One of the reasons taurine, which we use a lot in our practice, has recently come into play as an anti-aging agent is because of its effects on endothelial function and its effects on oxidative stress. Remember, LDL, not the bad guy. Oxidized LDL, the bad guy. If I can prevent oxidation of that LDL, I go a long way. So taurine will help prevent that oxidative stress. Total things like high-dose vitamin C. For those, for those of you guys who get like uh, IV vitamin C, high-dose vitamin C can also really markedly reduce that oxidative stress. And I see as somebody has very high oxidative LDLs. And this is, this is why it's so important to work with doctors who, who don't just look at cholesterol. You've got to look at ApoB, ApoA oxidized LDLs, LP little a, LP PLA2. There's so many things you have to look at to figure this out. And then when we see people who are at high risk, then we order a clearly scan. So we know that that we really have to get aggressive or we've got time to play with these people. So, so those are kind of my go-tos on that. And then another thing I love is oxytocin nasal spray. So if you think about oxytocin, it's traditionally used to facilitate labor, but there's a growing interest in it in treating hypoactive sexual desire disorder and female sexual dysfunction. Because oxytocin is naturally released in our brain to help make us want to be around people, to increase social behaviors. That's why when we first have our baby and we nurse, that there's tons of oxytocin flowing. We fall in love with that baby immediately, it falls back in love with us immediately. You know, the whole world after you have your baby, you like everybody more. It's just, you know, it, that's this very high oxytocin. There's some studies on oxytocin that you can take two people who hate each other and give them both oxytocin at a high level and they'll actually like each other. So it has that much impact. So basically it, it's been used, we use it a lot off-label to treat anxiety, depression, drug addiction, pain. Um, there's some studies on it in autism, but it can be used for sexual dys dysfunction as well. And what I a lot of times have people do is just every day do a little bit and then before sex, do more, do an extra dose of it. And it can work really well on some people. It can be done as a under the tongue drop or as an intranasal spray or as an injection. Intranasal spray, I think oftentimes is the easiest way to do it. Semaglutide, pizepatide, the newer generation, liraglutide, things like that are all what we call GLP-1 agonists, glucon-like peptide receptor agonists. And they have so many health benefits. And it's killing me to keep watching the Instagram posts and the doctors who are getting on talking about the dangers of semaglutide, how these are killing people and how horrible they are, because that, that simply is not true. Used appropriately, GLP-1 agonists, and that's why I encourage you to Google GLP-1 agonists and longevity and cancer and health, because semaglutide is going to have a lot of warped literature in there by people who have agendas. Whereas GLP-1 agonist, there's no agenda associated with it. It's not a drug, right? So always kind of go to what the drug is doing as opposed to the drug itself. You'll get more information, you'll get better information. But what are the benefits beyond its control of obesity? A lot of times we don't want them to continue to lose weight, right? So you can lower the dose way down where they're no longer having a lot of issues with not wanting to eat and with weight loss, but they get the other benefits. And the first is cardiovascular. There's a huge meta-analysis that was done in the last year that showed major adverse cardiovascular events like stroke, myocardial infarction, cardiovascular death was decreased by over 10%. So, you know, one out of 10 people had a, had a significant reduction in these major disease, death diseases, right? And that was irrespective of any changes in glucose or weight. There was a 10% reduction in hospitalizations due to heart failure. There was a reduced risk of coronary artery disease. They also significantly reduced inflammatory cytokines inflammatory cytokines that we associate with aging, like PNF-alpha, like interleukin-6, like interleukin-1-beta, those elevate in most of us as we age. If I have a drug that lowers all those, I can reduce the risk of almost all age-related diseases, autoimmune diseases, osteoarthritis. So reduce risk of coronary artery disease, reduce risk of autoimmune diseases, reduce risk of osteoarthritis. Alpha phosphatase is an enzyme, guys, that catalyzes, catalyzes chemical reactions in the body. And it's produced mainly in the liver and bones. So if it's elevated, it can suggest liver stress or it can suggest bone loss. 
It's actually one of the markers I follow to look at, for instance, when people are starting to get osteoporotic or osteopenic, they're losing bone. I look at outfoss. If outfoss is creeping up, likely, unless there's liver disease, there's bone loss going on. So it's that easy little marker you can follow for things like that. Um, it's important because it does help transport nutrients and enzymes. It helps with growth and maintenance of bones. So you need some. It does help transport calcium and phosphate from the intestines to the bones. Uh, and it transports fatty acids to store energy to in, into fat tissue. It's really important actually to regulating cell growth and fetuses during pregnancy. So if you saw a very low level in pregnancy, you really want to follow that person a little more closely. But low levels are much less common than high levels. And high levels are what we see the most and what I worry about the most because they're usually indicative of more of liver or bone dysfunction. When you see low levels, what can cause it is hypothyroidism. So you do want to make sure when you see a lower level, like I see somebody who's less than 40, then I will I would look and make sure that free T3 and free T4 are okay. I also want to look and make sure they're getting enough protein and fat because I think there's a lot of people who are deficient in protein and fat. And then if you're doing a good protein and fat intake, is there a reason you're not absorbing it? Is there inflammatory bowel issues or celiac disease? So those are things that would concern me. Otherwise, the low alkaline in view of no disease states that are linking to it probably is not a bad thing. The only other thing I, I can think of that might lower alkaline is a very high copper level. I, I know you might not be able to answer this easily, but if you had to pick one, what is the best anti-aging hack? Exercise. That's an easy one. Exercise in the sun. So you're getting circadian rhythm balance and you're getting the myokines produced by exercise. Myokines can cure cancer. They can stop inflammation. They can stop neurologic disease. You can make all these things that we're taking from your own body if you stimulate muscles. You got to lift weights. You got to do muscle strengthening exercise. Okay. So exercise in the sunlight. You got circadian rhythm and myokines.